Hi folks, my name is Adam and I like to make tiny nerdy things and this video is sponsored by Techland. Why? Because Dying Light 2 is celebrating its two year anniversary and Techland asked if I'd make them something like, oh, I don't know, a dude drop kicking a zombie off a building? Of course, this means I need to make a drop kicker and a drop kicky. And to ensure that I stay at least somewhat anatomically accurate, I'll make them both using this 15 centimeter skelly for scale. This will be my wimpy human with his wimpy human bones. And this will be my horrifying zombie with big old thick thighs. I need my zombie to be rocking extra big bones because he's going to be the balancing point for both models and I want to make sure that he's got enough girth to keep everything erect. Now, as far as attaching my man to my zombie, I'm pretty pleased with the solution I came up with. You see, I've got this brass rod that has the exact same internal dimensions as my usual armature wire, which means if I snip the tip of his leg off, I can replace his leg with the rod, which will in turn fit on an equally sized armature wire sticking out of the zombie's chest. That way, I can make both models entirely separately, then stick them together at the end. For now though, I'll set the dude to the side and get started making my zombie. Sorry, I keep saying zombie, but in Dying Light lore, they're actually called Infected, and there's a whole slew of progressively more horrifying versions I could have made. Like, like, look at it, look at this guy, he's all, he's all tentacly. Instead of that though, I opted for a more classically designed dead guy aesthetic since I'm a sucker for that fresh out of the grave look. I love a big spooky monster and all that, but the thing that makes zombies so spooky is that, much like people who play music without headphones on the bus, they're just barely riding the cusp of humanity. Otherwise, now that I've got my zombie appropriately caked up, I can start blending the various muscly bits together to give me a nice smooth body, then I can remove my faceless face and start making a face. I'll start by jamming a rod up into his skull and stabbing a big screamy mouth into the front of his face. I'll then poke a couple divots for eyeballs which can then be filled with eyeballs before poking some sniffing holes into the front and building up the flesh around his eyeball so he looks a little bit more angry. I'll then add some temporary teeth and do some more facial refining before doing some dental work and separating his single mouth spanning tooth into a bunch of little gnarly teeth. Some poking and prodding with a variety of clay shapers and ball styluses will give my healthy looking flesh skull a bit more of a weathered look and I can throw some extra dangly bits connecting his jaws for that added not quite alive look. A couple hearing hoops can go onto the sides of his heads and I can stick a big swollen tongue between his teeth before finally moving on to some final finishing features like big gaping wounds and an exposed skull. Otherwise, this six or so hour journey can be compressed into roughly 50 seconds of video, leaving me with a pretty gnarly looking head ready to be attached to my body. I've baked the head at this point, so I don't need to worry about smooshing the detail by accident, and I can blend the head into the neck, adding some veiny, wiry muscle between the two to connect them. Once I'd attached the head though, I felt he was missing something, so I slapped a little extra clay to his midsection to give him a little punch for obvious reasons. Then a little belly button to finish it off and I can get to making his hands. These start as they always do as little lumps of clay pinched and pulled into a flat oblong disc into which I'll cut four fingies. More pinching and pulling will elongate my fingies into proper fingers and I can add a thumb and some padding then stick them onto my zombie so it looks like he's really just after a hug. I'll then blend the hand into the forearm and add various lumps of clay somewhat haphazardly until my knobbly bits look knobbly and my smooth bits look smooth. If there's one lesson I can impart to aspiring sculptors, it's to make the lumpy bits look lumpy and make the smooth bits look smooth. Finally, I can rearrange the fingers so they're less jazz hands and more grab hands and it's time to make some battle damage. I don't actually know at this point what I'm doing with my life, I'm, what I'm doing with the zombie's clothing, so I want to err on the side of caution and just cover his body in lots of scratches and cuts and pockmarks. Most of this ends up getting covered up, but at least we'll get to experience this together. Also, it's been a while since I've done anything trypophobia inducing and I try to be inclusive. Otherwise, the final brushing with the stiff wire brush will add lots of natural looking scrapes and surface damage and I can finally add a foot. Not feet, of course, just the one foot since I've now decided he's only going to be wearing a single shoe. I build my feet much like I make my hands, but in such a way that they look like feet instead of hands since if they look like hands, they wouldn't look like feet and that wouldn't be what I'm going for. 
Now, before I add the clothes, I want to paint his body since there's a lot of stuff that would otherwise be hard to reach. I'll start by adding some dark reds and terracottas to the open wounds, then work my way up in progressively brighter tones until I've got a surface of bright red for the bloody bits. I'll then add some purple bruising around the wounds with the airbrush. This will also blow out some of the undried reds, creating natural dips that were totally intentional. Finally, the gray clay is perfect for a cold, dead corpse, but I want to bring a touch of life back, so I'll do some strategic touching up with bone white and pale flesh tones to add some depth and color variation. Once the paint's dried, it's back to sculpting, starting with that hitherto unfinished foot, which I'll finish by adding a loafer. I don't know why I decided on a loafer, but I think it was the right decision, and I'm happy I did. I chose bright orange for his trousers since I'm getting sick of making blue jeans. I feel like every sculpture I make, I give them jeans. Now, admittedly, jeans are basically the only piece of leg-based clothing I wear, so it's probably something about art imitating life. I thought the vibrant orange worked really well in contrast to the muted colors of the flesh, and I thought having my zombie wearing a pair of bright orange mechanics overalls would be some fun implied storytelling. And it was, at least, until I showed my patrons, and they all told me that orange jumpsuits are for prisoners. So, if anything, I guess that adds a bit more extra storytelling on top, since now you're wondering what this mechanic did to get himself arrested. Naturally, I opted for a tank top, since jumpsuits and tank tops are the height of fashion, and once I'd wormy dealied my way to lots of wrinkles, I can get back to finishing off his overalls by adding the upper half tied around his waist. This should also help to add a bit of movement to my zombies since I can have them flowing backwards to show he's being launched via dropkick backwards with a certain degree of force. Otherwise, with the jumpsuit sleeves in place, that's the sculpting finished so I can add the final touches. I'll paint the jumpsuit with a heavy orange wash to add a little shading before adding a series of progressively lighter orange dry brushes to give them a worn and faded look. I'll then add some dried blood stains around all the ripped bits by painting reds and browns on all the frayed bits of the pants and his shirt. Then some final spattering by way of the old flicky flicky method and that's my monster finished, which means it's time to make the dude. Before that though, a word from our sponsor, except that they asked me to put that at the end of the video since they thought it would kind of interrupt the flow of the video if I suddenly stopped and went into a pitch, which I suppose I've kind of done by doing this. Props to them though for believing my videos have any sort of flow rather than being a collection of half-finished thoughts mashed together and thrown over top of a poorly edited video full of dead memes. Regardless, stick around to the end of the video to learn more about Dying Light 2's big update and their free Steam weekend. Now, the dude's gotten a couple upgrades since you last saw him. Namely, I chopped the legs off and replaced them with a second tube so that I can more easily attach him to the base but still remove him to work on all his little details without a block of wood in the way. I'm also going to try and bulk up as much of his body as I can with aluminium foil since I want to keep the weight to a minimum to reduce the stress on that single armature wire sticking out of the zombie's chest. Otherwise, with the foil in place, I can start to build up the initial bulky clay layer, which I'll do in grey clay before making the rest of his body in colored clay. The dude, or Aiden, as he shall henceforth be referred to since, you know, that's his name, is a big TMNT fan, so he never leaves the house without his Ninja Turtle onesie tucked beneath whatever outer clothing he's wearing. This time, only his lower legs are uncovered, so I'll make his TMNT onesie with green clay and bake it to lock it in place before moving on to making his neck, shoulders, and head. Now, the building of Aiden is going to be peak trust the process since I'm going to be hopping around working on completely different parts as I go, so just bear with me. There is a method to my madness. Otherwise, once I'm happy with the size of the head, I'll pop it from his shoulders so I can get down to the detailing. Dying Light 2 tickles the little goblin part of my brain that demands I find progressively better, cooler looking outfits to wear with progressively higher numbers attached to them. As such, there's no shortage of potential outfits to outfit Aiden with, but I'm opting for the as-seen-on-TV look that the majority of his artwork seems to include, specifically that dope-ass leather jacket with the little red hood and, perhaps even more importantly, the mask. Well, I'm sure you like me. Sorry, there's supposed to be a comma there. While I'm sure you, like me, are filled with grayscale flashbacks to the time before when we were all masked up all the time, one seriously overlooked benefit of the mask aesthetic is that I don't have to make half the face. I just have to make some eyes, a nose, and some appropriately angry eyebrows, and that's pretty much it. I'll toss a couple ears in there for good measure, but that's pretty much my mouthless man ready for his body. With the head attached, I can scoop away the excess turkey neck, then bake it to lock it before getting to work on his pants. I'll slap some big blobs of brown clay over his skinny gray legs until I've got a pair of brown parachute shorts that can be wrinkled up nicely by squishing the clay around with a variety of tools. 
Then I'll use a sharper clay shaper to cut the lines into the backside to create the padded pants seat before doing the same to add the crotch padding and adding a couple seams and details to the sides of his pants and some final straps around his knees. Aiden's rocking a gray t-shirt under his leather jacket so I've mixed up some gray clay with some white to give me a slightly lighter color that I can use to cover the majority of his upper body. A thin strip around the waist will give the illusion of it being a loose fitting shirt and some final and wrinkling will finish the shirt off. Before I move on to making the leather jacket though, I want to make Aiden's mask because his mouthless face is starting to creep me out. To make his leather jacket, I'll start by enleathering his arms, shoulders, and back. I can then roll out a flat sheet of clay that I can cut to size and add the little details that will be too tricky to add once it's in place. I'll cut some oversized holes for the arms and fit it onto the body, doing the same for the other side, joining the collar in the back and leaving the front flapping in the wind. A little smoothing and I can blend the various bits of the jacket together before cutting away the excess of the collar, leaving me with a form-fitting leather jacket ready for texture. Much like I did with the pants, I'll cut the necessary seams into the arms and sides as well as add the detail to the upper back. Once the details are in place, I can start the enwrinkling of the leather by pressing tools into the clay to create what I hope are some natural looking leathery wrinkles on its back. I'll then do the same to the arms, making sure to hold the model out of focus and off camera to really remind the folk at Techland what they're paying for. I want Aiden to look like he's just about to launch the zombie backwards off the building and I want one of his feet to be flat while the other is pressing down with the ball of his foot. To do this, I've made a little ledge to sculpt one foot on top of so I can sculpt the other with just the toe touching the block. I'll then add the shoelaces and the red strap that keep his pants from sliding up while he's parkouring. I'll then wrap it in the bottoms of his TMNT leggings and keep it all in place with a couple leather straps. Back to his head, I'll make his hood by squishing a flat, slightly rounded sheet of red clay onto his shiny, hairless dome and blend it into the inside collar of his jacket. I'll then bake it once so it keeps its shape. That way I can add some wormy dealies on top and push and blend them around to create some natural folds and wrinkles. To make Aiden's fingerless leather gloves, I'll stick some fleshy clay onto some brown clay, smooth them together, then make his hands in exactly the same way I made the zombies. However, once I've attached the hand to the arm, I'll give him a quick Michael Jackson spin and get to work fashioning him a mighty weapon. One of the best parts of Dying Light for me is the slapdash weaponry you get to swing around. For instance, the axe I'm making for Aiden is just a no parking sign that's been sharpened and attached to a wonky steel rod. I cut some thin strips of aluminium from a can and folded them around the rod and onto the street sign. I've also got a bunch of these teeny tiny bolts and rivets from a project I did ages ago that are the perfect size. To wrap the handle, I've just cut a thin strip of painter's tape that I'll secure with a little super glue, then I can prime the whole thing black. I'll paint the metal bits with a metal paint and the grip tape with a couple coats of browns. To make the metal look like a sign, I'll paint one side white, then try my hand at making a no parking at any time sign before realizing I'm way too shaky for this shit, so I'll fix my mistakes by adding tons of weathering and damage and rust. I believe it was Michelangelo who said, when in doubt, rust it out. Otherwise, that's my off-brand Mjolnir ready to be summoned to Aiden's outstretched hand. His fingers get curled around the grip and I made his other hand into a fist off camera. All that's left to do then is add the various bits and bobs and accessories that are otherwise too flimsy to make until the end. Then one final bake and I can get to the painting. I'll start by giving all the large areas appropriately colored washes to add some sheeting and contrast as well as add a little dirt and grime. Once that's had a chance to dry, it's time to make his leather jacket look like leather. I'll start the unweathering of the leather by dabbing a yellow sandy color around the edges and on top of the wrinkles and anywhere that would naturally see a lot of wear. I'll then follow this up with a slightly darker shade applied in the same manner before going to town with some of the finer brushes to create some cuts and scratches and fill in any of the areas that I couldn't reach with the sponge. I know it looks a little vibrant right now, but wait till you see the magic of glazing. Glazes are basically extremely thinned out paints that you can apply over a surface to gradually build up a color which, in this case, will be the final dark leathery brown. Because the base color is already a pretty dark brown, the glaze won't have much of an effect on it, but it'll start to tint all the yellowy weathered bits and start to bring all the colors together, creating a pretty excellent looking leather jacket. I'll then highlight the edges of the hood and give it an aggressive dry brushing to make it look nice and faded before adding the light blue symbol on the front of Aiden's t-shirt. 
I'll paint the rim of the leather jacket red, then give it a darker wash to bring it more in line with the hood before giving his pants a couple coats of brown dry brushing to pick out all the wrinkles and folds and his TMNT leggings will get a lighter green dry brush to achieve the same. A couple of the anal arrows on his pants I'll paint with a charcoal gray and I can add the little white lines on his legs to finish the trousers off. I'll give his face a wash with a slightly darker flesh tone to highlight some of the details and scars Then I can very carefully attempt to give him eyes that are only slightly wonky. Finally, I'll give him some dark brown eyebrows and I've made a slightly boss-eyed Colin Farrell. All I need to do then is clean up the mask where I've overpainted Colin's face and that's my angry Irish zombie kicking dude done. Honestly, I think I could probably call it done here and I'd have a pretty good sculpture, except I did say I'd make a dude drop kicking a zombie off a building. So I guess I need to make a building. This is my big box of foam bits that I'm afraid to get rid of and inside I should be able to find some grade A foam offcuts that once carved, painted and assembled will be my dilapidated building base. Fortunately, I don't have to make the whole building, I just really need to make a roof and part of the top floor in order to sell the idea. To that end, I figured I could probably make the corner of said roof with a brick wall on one side and a window on the other. And for that added aesthetic, I'm gonna slightly angle my window. Now, with my angle window achieved, I can start the embrickening process. This mostly involves marking out what size I want my bricks to be and cutting the horizontal lengths of the wall. I'll then mark out the width of the bricks so that I can create the odd rows so they line up with one another. With the odd row bricks in place, I can do the same thing for the even row, but I won't bother measuring since I want them to be a little wonky anyways. And as simple as that, I've got a pretty good looking brick wall. All I need to do now then is repeat this process on the other three walls until all my walls are bricky. A little lump of pre-loved aluminium foil rolled into a sausage and applied vigorously over the surface will add the final brick texturing and I can pop the end bricks off since I want it to be a vignette inside the building and having a perfectly flat edge is kind of boring. To frame my window, I'll make a window frame with some thin strips of foam that I've cut to size and texturized with a stiff metal brush before adding the grills in the middle. With my frame in place, I can attach the two sides of the wall with the help of a little foam safe CA glue and cover the edge with a thick rock corner piece and the exposed bottom bricks with a couple little strips as well. To finish the corner off, I also made a concrete base, a fitted wooden floor and a stony slab for the roof. That then is my lovely little corner of a building perfect for kicking zombies off of. However, before I get to the painting, I want to seal everything in a coat of white sriracha and black paint. This will seal and protect the foam as well as prime it to make the painting a little easier. As for the painting, I'll give each piece a coat of light grey. The concrete and stony bits are going to be grey anyway, so this will cut out a couple of the coats there, and the brown of the wood and the red of the bricks will benefit from a lighter base coat as well. Now, maybe it would have been easier to mix grey with the PVA glue in the last step, but hindsight is 2020 and it's 2024 now, and you need to stop living in the past. In the present, I can paint my bricks with a brick-colored red and my wooden bits with a wooden-colored brown and my rocky bits with a rocky-colored grey. Once I've done the same to the other pieces, I'll crack out my fancy spray bottle filled with my pre-mixed wash. I'll apply this liberally over everything, then rub away the excess with some paper towel. This will leave the wash to sink into the grooves and recesses, creating some deep shadows while simultaneously tinting everything slightly browny black. I can then leave this to dry for an hour or so before coming back to grout my bricks. This is just a little pot of plaster of Paris that I'll sprinkle over my bricks, brush off the excess, then blast with some very, very thin PVA glue. I'll do the same thing to the outside walls and after about a half an hour the real plaster is dry and I can apply the fake plaster to the inside wall using my favorite non-sponsored product, One Strike Filler. This is just some simple lightweight hole filler that I'll smear over the inside wall until it's partially covered, leaving some sections chipped and clear. It takes about 30 minutes to dry, so while I'm waiting for that, I'll cut some thin strips of perspex to fit inside my window frame. This is a post-apocalyptic building, so I'll make sure to smash a couple of the windows before gluing them in place with a dab of CA glue. Once it's all dry, I can assemble my building gluing the walls to the floor and the floor to the floor and the roof to the walls. 
The majority of the buildings in Dying Light 2 are absolutely covered in moss and plants and living things, so I need to make this building appropriately green, which I'll do by applying a heavy coat of dirty down moss. I'll paint it between the cracks of the bricks and stipple it around haphazardly on the stony bits, as well as on top of the roof and along the cracks and just kinda everywhere. As it dries, it creates a terrific looking natural mossy discoloration, but it's a bit too flat, so I've mixed up some dark green ink into some modeling paste that I can apply with a sponge to create a bit of texture as well. I'll then attach some hanging moss around the lip of the roof and around the window, sprinkling the various bits of leaves that fell off while I was ham-fistedly tearing it apart. A spritz of thinned out PVA glue will hold it in place, and I can add some strips of grass between the cracks on the roof before sprinkling some more leaves and detritus on top. Now I've got a big blank wall that I want to add something to and I thought I'd try my hand at spray painting some graffiti. And to make that graffiti look like it was sprayed via spray can, I thought I'd try and use my airbrush. Now I'm no artist, so actually painting something is beyond the scope of my skills, but I figured I could probably write something dying light appropriate. And you know what? While it's not good, it is good enough. Finally, that inside wall was looking a little too clean, so I'll paint it with an incredibly thinned out all over khaki wash before applying some more strategically placed darker brown and green stains. The nature of the whole filler means it soaks out thin paints wonderfully, creating a really nice natural looking discoloration. I'll add some little bits of broken perspex around the windows, as well as add some more leaves and detritus before finally adding a single bloody handprint on the wall. Yeah, except that my paint was perhaps a bit too thin and what was supposed to be streaky ends up looking more like a stain. So I'm just going to lean into that and flick some red droplets all willy-nilly all over everything. Finally, the roof was perhaps a bit too flimsy, so I made an upright beam to fit into the corner and at long last, my building is done and I can finally add my kicky as well as my kicker. And with that, we're all done here and... Onto the glamour shots. Before that though, a big thank you to Techland for sponsoring this video. You can play Dying Light 2 for free on Steam right now until February 26th and any progress you make during the free weekend, you get to keep if you choose to buy the game. This weekend includes the Firearm update which, shockingly, adds firearms to the game as well as many more highly requested community features. Take on survivor missions in co-op or go it solo, try out a slew of new combat challenges, enjoy the beautiful enhanced new visuals and see what weird and wonderful maps the community has put together. There's no better time to give it a try than right now, so follow the link in the description below and go dropkick some zombies. As always, a massive thank you to the fine folk over on Patreon who continue to support the creation of tiny nerdy things, and a huge thank you to Techland for sponsoring this video. If you want to do a little parkour while kicking zombies in the face, then follow that link below and have a little look for yourself. You won't be disappointed. Otherwise, we'll uh, see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>